Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Good morning. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. When you get there, say amen. How many of you know can turn to 1 Peter at the drop of a hat? It's not one we necessarily turn to a lot. It's a small book, but it's back there in the back towards Revelation and uh, James and Jude and all those good books. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7, the Bible says, The end of all things is near. Therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. The reason for sound judgment, the reason for being sober is for the purpose of prayer. A couple mornings ago, I'm having my devotions on the couch and I see uh, my alarm clocks, both of them, playing with uh, some animals and uh, Thatcher's got an animal in his hands, and Jude's got an animal in his hands, and they're both kneeling there playing together, right kind of to the left of my feet. And then Jude all of a sudden says, Thatcher, let me see your, uh, your animal. So he takes his animal and says, Thatcher, we need to pray. And I stop, and I'm just like, I look down, and he says, okay, Thatcher, fold your hands. Thatcher folds his hands. Close your eyes, Thatcher. Dear Jesus, please be with the animal. And as, that, as Judah's kneeling there, he then bends over and is just puts his head on the ground and begins whispering. I don't hear a word he's saying. And he gets up and says, Amen. Thatcher opens his eyes up. They start playing. Not but a minute later, Jude goes, Thatcher, we need to pray. Okay. Thatcher, fold your hands. Folds his hands. Close your eyes, Thatcher. Thatcher closes his eyes again. Dear Jesus, Please be with all the animals. Help us have a good day. Amen. Opened their eyes and got back to playing. And I'm sitting there thinking, I praise God for my wife. I praise God for my wife. There are going to be moments in your life where you're going to see people around you that are close. And it's not going to be an accident who they are because sometimes we rub off on them a little bit our children need to see their parents praying our children need to see our parents reading their Bibles our children need to see our parents coming to church our children are going to see something in our lives and we are going to rub off on them what is going to rub off on them? I ask kids when I go to week of prayers, what kind of a person do you want to be in 10 years? And so we talk about what they want to be in 10 years, and I say, okay, so these are the types of decisions you have to make now for, your, for you and your life, not that it's a guarantee by any means, but for you and your life to help accomplish where you want to be in 10 years. What kind of a person do you want to be in 10 years? Well, I want to be a good person. Okay, well, these are the types of decisions good people make. So you can begin laying a foundation and fortifying. But then to ask parents, what, kind, what do you want your children, what kind of people do you want your children to be in 10 years? Okay, well, then these are some of the decisions you make as parents. So that in 10 years, not that it's a foolproof plan because we live in a sinful world, but these are the types of decisions. What kind of church do we want in 10 years? Okay, well, if we start having some ideas coming to our minds, there are some decisions and things we do now so that we can be whatever it is we want in 10 years. The Bible says here, the end of all things is near. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober in spirit for the purpose of prayer. Brothers and sisters, I want this to be a praying church. I don't want prayer to be something we relegate to one portion of our service. So once we come to the praises and prayer requests aspect, we have accomplished prayer and we can move on from prayer. Prayer is something we incorporate in our lives on a daily, second, minute, hourly basis. It's communion. It's communication with our God Almighty. So if that's what I want, what kind of decisions do I need to be making now? 
And if the end of all things is near, what kind of decisions do I need to be making right now? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, I pray for your word today. God, I pray for our lives to be filled with prayer. Not where we stop and get on our knees at every mile marker to pray. But that every moment of the day we are in constant communication with God. That this isn't just something we, we relegate to a, an aspect of our lives. So when we come, from home, come home from work, we leave, we leave work at work. We leave this over here, we leave this over here. We don't let things bleed into each other. We compartmentalize things. God, I pray for prayer to bleed into every aspect. For us to be marinated in prayer. Soaked in prayer. And for your Holy Spirit to be poured out in prayer. God, you know what we need. We think we know what we need, and there's times we do know. But God, I pray right now for you to convict us. Convict us of what we need. And help us to make the decisions that need to be made to accomplish your will and your goals in our lives. I pray for this service, Lord. Lord, I pray for us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. For your word to turn us to Jesus. Because God in his infinite power and glory is drawing, drawing people to Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen. I have one request when I get in my car and drive. I just have one. It's very simple. I don't think I'm asking a lot. But when I get behind the wheel and I pull out onto the road, I expect everybody else on the road to be sober. Is it too much to ask? Sober. And actually, let me add a second request to that. I would ask that you do not text on your phone while you're driving. I just watched this video of this trucker who's driving down the road and he's looking at his Facebook and pictures and plows into three police cruisers, killing one police officer. I don't know what happened with the others, but one police officer was pulling out and he's got the truck on cruise control and just plows into this police car. Once he hits the first one, he then veers off the shoulder, veers off onto the shoulder and hits the second police cruiser. All of this is caught on his camera. The video shows one camera looking at the driver and one camera looking at the road ahead. So you see a split screen of what's happening. You see all of this take place. He's looking down, and when he hits the first car, the phone pops out of his hands. When you're driving... When I'm driving, there are reasonable expectations that we can have of people. And all of us have driven up close to somebody and seen them looking down at their phone. Citizens arrest. But I, but I got to send this. I got to send this. And there's also a YouTube clip where this person doesn't even finish their text before they get in an accident. Why? Because their eyes aren't on the road. But also, if they've been drinking, they have a foreign substance influencing their decision and mobility behind the wheel. Those are some reasonable expectations we can have of myself and other drivers. The Bible says right here, be sober, use good, sound judgment. And I don't know if you've ever seen this before. I've seen people handcuffed on the side of the road, but I have yet to see somebody walking the yellow line or the red line or the white line on the side of the road. Have you guys, has anybody ever seen that? Oh, Fern, it was not you. That, you're not saying I was doing that. You're saying you've seen someone do that. There we go. That, hypothetically speaking, Fern, it was somebody else. So, and if, they, if they're inebriated or under the influence, they're not going to be able to walk the line. Well, Jesus Christ asks us to walk a line. He asks us to walk the straight and narrow. And the only way we can walk the straight and narrow is to make sure that we are incorporating things into our decision-making and judgment because all of us use our judgment on a daily basis. We judge whether or not we're going to get vanilla or chocolate. And if you just had vanilla that morning, maybe you'll have chocolate the next time. 
Or maybe we make a judgment call on whether or not I'm going to accept this job. And all these other factors come into your decision-making process on whether or not you're going to accept this position. Whether you're going to marry somebody, you're going to take factors into account. Every day, if I'm going to buy a clothing item, you're going to take factors into account. And when we make moral, moral decisions, we are going to take factors into account. Do you want to know one of the biggest things that hammered the Israelites before they entered the promised land? Oh, man, Dwight Nelson preaches a powerful sermon on this. They're about to cross over to the promised land. And do you know what Israel gets wrapped up in? Sexual immorality. Do you know what our world deals with today that we're getting hammered with as you drive down the road? Sexual immorality. When you turn on the television, sexual immorality. When you walk into department stores, sexual immorality. Wherever we turn, it seems like we are bombarded with it because maybe, just maybe, we're about to enter into the promised land. Enter into the promised land. And so we are going to have lots of factors coming in. Now, I know I've shared this before, but I want to remind you before we go any further. When we talk about judgment, whenever we watch television, whenever we watch certain things or take things in, each one of us, each one of us has a moral filter. And when we critically think about what we're watching or seeing or hearing, we process that through our moral filter. And it's able to weed things out. So then when we see something, we say, no, that is not right. And we have then morally filtered it, and it does not go into us. We may still see it or hear it, but our minds have disposed of it. If we watch a television show, and we see immorality put in a certain way, and we then invest ourselves into this, and we either laugh or cry or emotionally get involved in it, what happens is what we see flanks our moral filter and goes into our minds. And then what happens then is that thought doubles back to our moral filter and then influences our moral filter so that the next time we see it, we accept it. So then if I'm laughing at somebody sleeping with five different people, (laughs) and they got caught, what are they going to do in this situation? Oh my goodness, oh my, I can't believe they have to go through this. I can't believe they're being torn. Who on earth would tear these two people apart? Oh, my heart breaks for them. We get involved in it, and it bypasses, it doubles back, and the next time we see it in real life, we accept it. And that becomes a part of morality for us. So then for each one of us, what are we taking into us that is helping make up our moral filter as far as what we weed out and what we take in? I need to be reading my Bible every single day. I heard a sobering, sobering statistic. Pastors across the United States spend on average seven minutes in prayer a day. That's if they pray every day, on average. The rest of Christianity, around three minutes. That's if you pray every day. Maybe you pray ten minutes one day, and then you don't pray the rest of the six days. Seven minutes, less than three minutes. So then each one of us has the challenge. The end of all things is near. What is going into my thought processes, my sound judgment, so that it's sound not according to the world standards, but according to biblical standards, what is, what is am I allowing into my life to help me make decisions on X or make decisions on Y or make decisions on Z? And we have got to be in here. Now I want to say this. The Pharisees, you know where they were? They were in the Bible. You know where the Sadducees were? They were in the Bible. They didn't agree with all of it, but they were there. Jesus says, my followers will worship in spirit and truth. And the Pharisees, they had truth. They read it every day. They memorized the word of God. But that doesn't mean they had sound judgment. We have got to be praying for the Holy Spirit. Because the, Holy, the Bible doesn't say, and if you follow the pastor, the pastor will lead you into all truth. If you follow this person, this person will lead you into all truth. The Bible says that if the, when the Holy Spirit, the Helper, comes, the Holy Spirit will lead you into truth. So that when I read my Bible, I don't read it without the Holy Spirit, because if I read it without the Holy Spirit, the blind lead the blind. 
and I need eyes because I cannot see. So I pray for the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to guide me through your words because I think this, but am I wrong? And if I am, help me to accept it and, rec- and correct it and walk in the right way. And the Holy Spirit will convict, will move, will impress. One of the greatest disservices any of us can do is if we rely on others exclusively. Others may be right. They may see it the right way. But we have got to be in the habit of getting on our knees and praying to God. Praying and asking for the Holy Spirit because we have to become familiar with that Spirit. I wish you guys, uh, for those of you who don't come, I would encourage you to come to prayer meeting because one of the things we just talked about this past week is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3 where it talks about how the word of the Lord was rare in those days during the reign of high priest Eli. Well, why was the word of the Lord rare if they had a high priest? Because the, the high priest wasn't giving the word. And so his visions were rare in that day. But then it says Samuel comes along, and the Lord began to reveal himself through Samuel. Finally, God had somebody that he could use that would share the word of God and he can use. And Samuel didn't know the voice of God at first. How many of you know the voice of God in your life? Man, you think Abraham questioned the voice of God in his life when he told him to took Isaac? What God asked, Isaac, what God asked Abraham to do was not to the law and to the testimony. That was not biblical. It was not moral, what God was asking Abraham to do. But it didn't matter. It was what God asked. It's what God said. So the Word of God, are you familiar with the Word of God? We have got to get familiar. Because you want to know something about this world? This is what's great about this world. There's a lot of voices. They're chattering. They're talking. Trying to get your attention. Trying to tell you things. Hey, come on over here. Come over here. Come over here. Hey, yeah, yeah, come over here. Come here. You hear it all over the place. You go to Vegas, oh my goodness, there's some, not that I've been there, but there's voices. There's voices. You go to the department store, if you go to Jamaica, if you go there, you have all these little things, these little booths set up, and there's all these people that are trying to sell their knickknacks. Hey, come over here, come over here. And these tourists come by. Hey, hey, come over here, come over here, come here. I got, hey, come over here, come over here. Hey, yeah, yeah, come on. And that's what we got in this world. We got all these people. Hey, hey, come over here. And so we listen to all these little voices. Oh, come over here. This is the voice that we need to be familiar with. This is the voice we need to be reading and taking in. And we need to be praying for the Holy Spirit so that we don't hear our voice when we read this. We don't hear our sinful nature's voice, but we hear God's voice cut through the darkness and reveal light. I love this verse. Tammy, did. thank you. You did an incredible job. Thank you very much for those children. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. This is light. Light. Now, I want to reveal some light that happened to me. Verse 8. Above all, keep fervent, dedicated, intentional in your love for one another. Don't take a nap on loving other people. Don't slack on loving other people. Don't sleep on loving other people. Above... When, whenever in the Bible, when a call for the kingdom of God is coming or an end time message is given, two things are accompanied with that. Repentance. Repentance. Is there something in your life that you're hanging on to that you don't want to let go? Is there something in your life that you know is wrong and you recognize it? I am an alcoholic. I admit it. And once you admit there's a problem, you can then begin addressing it. I admit this in my life. I admit this. I am addicted to this. God, you know it. I need to deal with it. I recognize it in my life. And I repent and I beg for you to help me. Please come and help me. The second thing that always accompanies a message of end time or second coming message is that of godly conduct godly conduct. And so since the end of all things is near, above everything, above all things, fervently love. And this is how you, this is what fervent love for one another accomplishes. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Just because I love, that doesn't mean it covers my sins. Love covers your sins against me. Oh! Do you know what I want to tell people if someone's wronged me? I don't want to cover it. I want to expose it. 
Isn't that what sinful natures want to do? Is when someone's wronged us, we want to let other people know how they've wronged us? You wouldn't believe what they did. We don't, it's not gossip. People need to know about this so that it doesn't happen to them either. I'm the good Samaritan here, people. I'm here to protect. I am the watchman so that this guy doesn't do it to you too or this girl doesn't do it to you too. Oh, listen, I'm going to get wronged. People are going to sin against me in small ways and in major ways. We live in a very sinful, grotesque world. And people are going to sin against you. And they're going to wrong you in minor ways and in major ways. But we talk about that shield of faith, what we arm ourselves up. And we have that shield of faith. Those sinful things that people have done against us can be deflected so that we now love can overcome and cover so that we don't deal with people as they've treated us. We deal with people how Jesus Christ has treated us. It is hard to cover other people's sins against us because when people have wronged us, that's all we see in them. Have you wronged Jesus Christ? There's times where people are going to come to you and say, listen, I I made a mistake and I I want to apologize. And they're going to hurt you again. And they're going to come and apologize. And they're going to hurt you again. Do you know how many times it happens to God? And did God say, listen, hold hold on a second. (laughs) I'm done with you. Godly conduct. The second coming of Jesus Christ. We're here today because Jesus Christ said, I'm not done with you. We're here today because when we ate the fruit and we sinned and we rebelled, God said, I'm not done with you. And let me show you what I'm going to do for you now. And then he came and he walked and he manifested the character of God. The character of God. This God that no matter what happens, I'm going to love you. I'm going to kill you with kindness. And we all have to be killed. We all have to die to self. This is something we all have to bring. Some of us have real anger issues where we are so angry inside about something that we have never dealt with it and we don't want to let go of it. It's a, it's a burning fire that rages in us and every, it just it motivates us. And you know what that does? It influences our judgment. Do you know the devil is going to use whatever he can before Jesus Christ comes? Whatever he can. It may not be anger, it may be something else. It may be gossip. Maybe a spirit of distrust. It may be a spirit of negatively assuming things about everybody. Always assuming the worst. Listen, you know what I've, for 32 years I've been clean. Third, I'm 32 years old, by the way, but for 32 years I've been clean. I haven't murdered anybody in 32 years. <sighs> I'm so proud of myself. You know what, for 32 years I haven't committed adultery. I'm that, I'm that dedicated. Now, I know I've stolen in those 32 years. I know I've lied in those 32 years. But do you want to know something? In 32 years, I've never worshipped an idol. Isn't that impressive? I've never worshipped an idol. I've never taken in a curse word in public the Lord's name in vain. I have accomplished all those things. You know who else accomplished all those things? the rich young ruler. He wasn't lying when he said he'd done all those things from his youth. He had done all of it from his youth. But do you want to know what he hadn't done from his youth? Maybe there's points in his life he'd done it. But you want to know what he didn't do? Didn't love Jesus. He loved money. 
He loved power. He loved position. He just didn't love Jesus. So there's a lot of things we can do, but above all, God calls us to love. And what each one of us needs to know is love raises the standard. Because I haven't murdered. And to my knowledge, none of you have either. But there's going to be times where we're going to deal with hate. We're going to deal with that. Now, we haven't committed adultery. But there's going to be times where you're going to be looking on the screen. And we may not have dealt with worshiping an idol, but there's other things we hold on to. It may not be a graven image, but it may be green. There's a lot of things. A lot of things. But we're here today to celebrate one. That's the cross. Jesus calls us all to come to the cross. And once we come there, you know what's next? The gates of heaven. We pass through the grave because Jesus Christ has conquered the grave. We pass through the grave. We come out on the other side because we've accepted Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people who have done some illegal things that have gone to the Oval Office. I've never been to the Oval Office. Why? I don't know the president. And you don't know me. I'm going to make some mistakes. There's going to be a lot of good people down here who are going to say, Lord, I healed a lot of people. I, did a lot of, I brought a lot of people to Jesus. And he's going to say, you know what? <laughs> I don't know you. What's your name again? This person didn't heal. This per di person didn't do these things. <laughs> hey, Jim, come here, brother. Come on, Jim. Come on in. Jim? Yeah, man. We're like this. We're here for Jesus. But we're also here so we can be like this with Jesus. So when he comes home, when he, come, well, he, when he comes back to this earth, he's going to take all his friends home. He's going to take all his children home. And by accepting Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. Don't let anybody ever take that away from you. When you accept Jesus, you are a child of God. We're going to break for communion for the ordinance of humility. As you wash feet, it is a symbol but it's a symbol that is manifested from the heart that is, brings its significance from our relationship with Jesus Christ. So when we take part in washing someone's feet, we're taking part in cleansing and washing them of sin. If you've been baptized, you don't need to be baptized again. You've been baptized. I just need to wash your feet now. Don't take this lightly. This is a, an extreme uh, manifestation of, a, of our relationship with Jesus and a washing away of, of wrongs. If there's somebody you've wronged in this church and the Lord is impressing you to wash their feet, wash their feet. It's communion, a time of forgiveness, of unity, of a coming together as one body in Christ and worshiping and serving one another and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's have prayer and then I'll let you know where we can go. Father in heaven, I pray for the communion service. Lord, I pray this isn't just another communion service. This isn't just another Sabbath we go through where we wait for sundown. God, I pray that we, we push off sundown, that we fight off sundown today so that we can spend one more second with Jesus in these holy sanctified hours that have been set apart for us and we've been set apart for you. I pray that as we wash feet, Lord, you would forgive. And if we need to seek forgiveness, Lord, I pray that relationships are repaired and mended, whether it's between a husband and wife or between friends or acquaintances. I pray that the devil does not have victories in any one of our relationships but that Jesus Christ rides in and conquers and overcomes. Love covers a multitude of sins. God, the blood that was shed on Calvary covers my sins. And each person in here, it covers them as well. And there's power in that blood, power to overcome this world. 
power to be victorious. And Lord, I pray that as we wash each other's feet, Lord, victory, victory in the name of Jesus is accomplished. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.